Good morning, everybody. What an absolute delight to be here in the fantastic um, VU virtual space. My name's Dr. Josie Vine. I come from RMIT Journalism, and I'm overjoyed today to introduce Dr. Kate Fitch, who's from Monash University. She specialises in socio-cultural approaches to PR, particularly, which I'm really interested in from a feminist perspective. The paper she's going to um, present to us today outlines a fascinating investigation into the work of two women for the very masculine organisation, the Australian Wool Bureau between the 50s and 70s. So all yours, Kate. Thanks so much for that introduction, Josie. I'm just going to get my um, slides up. So thanks for coming, everyone. I want to start with a, um, just acknowledging that I'm uh, presenting from the unceded lands of the Kulin Nation. I'm in Wurundjeri country at the moment. This paper investigates the promotional work performed by women in association with the Australian Wool Bureau and the Australian Wool Board, and um, hereafter I'll just refer to it as the Wool Board, for approximately a decade from 1959. Wool played a key role in Australia, first as its major economic driver up until the 1960s, and second to its national and cultural identity. Drawing on, drawing on archival and secondary sources, fashion ephemera and memoirs, this paper explores the promotional activity of two women responsible for developing a new modern aesthetic for Australian wool, increasing consumption nat nationally and internationally and establishing it as a premier fashion item. Nan Sanders and Joy Jobbin's work extended beyond traditional advertising and depended on a sound understanding of media practices and industries. Promotional work is fundamental to to the production, circulation, dissemination of ideas, taste and consumption. Yet it's under-researched and we do not fully understand the interaction between different media roles and work. This paper highlights the role of feminized labor in media and promotional work. Women's media work has been described as invisible. The value in understanding women's promotional work is its importance as an under-researched aspect of media history. In recent years, historical research on the role of women in media and to a lesser extent in promotional industries has grown. These studies offer convincing evidence that women participated in media and promotional work and yet are poorly represented in contemporary histories. Certain kinds of work, particularly work associated with publicity and promotion, marketing, event management, and in certain sectors such as fashion, tend to be exclu excluded from professional industry narratives and histories. And it's no accident that these sectors are highly feminized. I do want to acknowledge that Jackie Dickinson investigated Sanders and Jobbin's work for the Wool Board as part of her broader investigation into women in Australian advertising history. Dickinson employed a broad understanding of advertising in that it encompassed various skills retail advertising, public relations, the creative industries, journalism, political activism and philanthropy, as well as mainstream advertising. This expansion of the definition was necessary to be able to make women's work visible. And as I have found in public relations history, women's work tends to get pushed to the margins of the professional narrative. After reaching record prices in the post-war consumption boom, the wool trade was threatened by the post-war growth of cotton and synthetic textiles. The price of wool halved between 1953 and 1958, and one economist warned that Australia was falling off the sheep's back. Although Australia dominated the international wool market, the domestic industry was um, highly politicised and divided. So William Gunn, from a fourth generation of a Gundawindi grazing family, became the Wool Board Chairman in 1958 and International Wool Secretariat Chair in 1961, which was the same year he was knighted. Gum was a formidable operator, full of cunning and political savvy. Nan Sanders said that Gunn counts heads like a worker counts his pay packet. He cleaned out senior management at the Wool Board and became Chief Executive, a position he held for the next 13 years. In an address that was reprinted widely in the regional press, Gunn announced his plans for the Wool Board following his review and organisational restructure. 
and he designed to increase the consumption of wool in Australia as quickly as possible and to develop new export markets for their products. Nan Sanders was critical to his vision. At the time of her recruitment, Sanders worked at ICI, where she had overseen the launch and promotion of their new synthetic fibre, Terraline, perceived as a major competitor to wool. Nancy Markham Sanders was an accomplished businesswoman who had worked in sales, marketing and promotional roles in Australia, England and Hong Kong prior to her appointment at the Wool Board at the age of 37. This role ensured a public profile for Sanders, who travelled extensively, nationally and internationally, and appeared comfortable in front of the media, opening sheep shows, judging fashion shows, visiting international fashion houses, hosting trade delegations, fashion designers and wool industry representatives, and presenting to corporate boards, government ministers, and international bodies such as the International Wool Secretariat. Sanders frequently fronted the media or attended events alongside Gunn. Sanders brought to the role a focus on branding Australian wool rather than presenting it as an alternative to synthetics, and her close connections with retailers, fashion journalists, and editors. Jobbins, who'd worked closely with Sanders on the Terralina account when she was at Cardin Advertising, attributed Sanders' success to her expertise in industry liaison and access to senior management across the textile industry. Nevertheless, Sanders' appointment was controversial and she faced an immediate backlash with news stories claiming that her annual salary funded by levies on wool growers meant she was the highest paid woman in Australia. By all accounts, Sanders was a tough negotiator who more than held her own in the highly masculine corporate government and agricultural sectors. Drawing on interviews with Sanders and other wool board staff, Massey, in his book, Breaking the Sheep's Back, which was an investigation of the wool industry, describes her exotic and idiosyncratic style. And I want to just read a short paragraph by Massey writing about Nan Sanders. Lodged in the midst of the conservative wool board public service world in Woolhouse, Sanders' exotic tastes, her idiosyncratic doting on two French poodles, the dominance of female staff in her department and her use of strong colours, it was like a fantasy world in there, recalled wool board employee at the time, Trevor Johnston, soon led to her office being scathingly dubbed the boudoir in Burke Street. Moreover, when not travelling widely, Sanders held court at a permanent table in Melbourne's leading restaurant, Florentino's, where members of the retail and rag trade gained regular access to her. Sanders worked at the wool board for almost a decade, resigning in 1968 when she was effectively, like Gunn, pushed out. Joy Malcolm was born in Sydney in 1927 and her father worked as a cinematographer, which probably enabled her early work as a script girl on a US wartime propaganda film and some modelling. Malcolm trained in art but maintained she was of average talent and not good enough to be a serious artist. She worked in retail advertising in department stores, first with Anthony Hordens in Sydney, and then when she followed her future husband, Henry Jobbins to Melbourne at Maya, where she first began working with photographer Helmut Newton. Jobbins left just before the birth of her first child. However, financial concerns meant she needed to return to work not long after her daughter's birth, and she quickly found work as a copywriter. Ralph Blunden then invited Jobbins to manage the fashion accounts at Cardin Advertising, which was a shift from the retail advertising she'd done previously, and she developed considerable expertise managing the House of Leroy and Terralene accounts. She left with Ralph Blunden in 1959 when he secured the wool board account and was able to establish his own agency. Jobbins found both Cardin Advertising and the Blundons to be supportive employers, paying her a stipend on maternity leave and scheduling meetings at her home around breastfeeding schedules. However, the merger, the merger of Blundons to become Thompson Ansel Blunden in 1962 led to considerable tension. Up until then, Jobbins said she was totally involved with the creative side of the agency's business and ignorant of the politics and power games. The merged agency was very tycoonish and memo oriented, and Jobbins not only had less creative control, but had to contend with challenges to her control over the wool board budget. Jobbins attributed this to the mistaken idea that they could increase their share of the direct advertising budget, whereas much of it was allocated to industry liaison rather than advertising. In the end, Jobbins was seconded to and eventually moved permanently to the wool board, 
staying with them even after returning to Sydney until 1972. In retrospective accounts, Jobbins did not view her woolboard wool board work as advertising, but as promotion. Advertising is what you see. Promotion gets the media talking, she said. In this, Jobbins perhaps recognises the broader cultural impact of her work and the ways that escaped the confines of traditional advertising. Jobbins also acknowledges the talented creatives she relied on in her work and their significant contributions to developing campaigns, themes and images. These included illustrator and later Vogue, Vogue Australia creative director, Patrick Russell, and photographers, Henry Talbot and Helmut Newton. In 1959, Sanders and Jobbins presented their plans across Australia. They provided a calendar with information on promotional activities such as fashion parades, exhibitions, and wool festival weeks to the industry, and identified um, three wool board promotional objectives including the need to recapture the wonder and glamour of wool as a textile fibre. Sanders orchestrated a national series of wool festivals, annual fashion awards and parades, resulting in prominent media coverage and co-promotions with manufacturers and retail stores. Under Sanders and Jobbins, wool board promotion was ambitious and wide ranging. It encompassed research and technical services, focusing on wool quality, industry stakeholder engagement with growers, buyers, mills directly involved in wool production, with manufacturers, designers and retail stores in the fashion sector, with architects and designers in the construction industry, and extended to media relations, corporate affairs, government relations and public diplomacy. It therefore extended beyond traditional product publicity and direct advertising. The shift from straight advertising was an important part of Sanders' promotional strategy, as she placed a greater emphasis on promotional activities, industry liaison and cooperative um, promotion with mills, manufacturers and retailers. Her annual campaigns nominated fashion colours for the textile industry, drawing on trends in Europe. Uh, so she nominated colours for the following year for the textile industry to adopt, and she supported these with themed campaigns in co-promotions with the industry, such as the one you can see here, Wild Colonial Colours. Jobbins described the Woolboard account as the most wonderful and exciting fashion account in Australia, and its large budget enabled new iconic images li linking settler colonial Australian wool and contemporary fashion with cosmopolitan Australia. There was resistance and animosity to the wool board's promotion, funded uh, pr primarily by levies on wool growers, and much of it was perceived as extravagant and unnecessary. Gun famously was pelted with eggs and flour. The discussion of wool board promotion highlights the interaction between media and promotional work and the need to recognize the movement across these roles. Jobbins found, founded a magazine and produced a television show after leaving the wool board in 1972. And although not a focus in this paper, it's worth noting the career trajectory of Jobbins' former secretary at London's, June McCallum. McCallum took over from Jobbins at, as the account executive, but when the merged agency lost the wool board account, she left and became a fashion journalist in England. In 1976, she was appointed editor of Vogue Australia, a position she held until her retirement in 1992. Most of the historical work on promotion in Australia has focused on advertising. However, the wool board budget was significant for Australian advertising, public relations and media industries. London left Carden advertising on the strength of the wool board account to set up his own agency, and Jobbins identified the tensions at that agent around the merged agency around too much of the budget being spent on non-advertising promotional activity. The wool board account had, had considerable power and Jobbins and Blunden were consulted on whether Australia was ready for an upmarket fa fashion magazine, Vogue Australia. Their commitment to support the publication with double page spreads in colour in its first year enabled it to be launched and ensured ongoing industry support. According to the Wool Board Annual Report in 63-64, the Australian promotion included 520 advertisements in media to promote trade and consumer awareness of the wool campaigns. The promotional activity at the Wool Board under Sanders and Jobbins also points to cracks in the growing demarcation between occupational fields and professional imperatives in the post-war era. For example, public relations sought greater professional recognition as a unique, unique field of expertise even if it was often conducted under the auspices of advertising and in advertising agencies. 
Dickinson's decision to expand the concept of advertising to enable her to recognise women's contributions makes sense and illustrates the marginalisation and even exclusion of women's work from professional narratives. Ironically, the wool board promotion has been investigated by various disciplinary perspectives, including for its newsreels, photography, um, and particularly the impact of Tal Talbot and Newton, wool marketing history, and from fashion. With the notable exception of Dickinson, the contributions of Sanders and Jobbins remain marginal to promotional and media histories. There is significant scholarship on the wool board, including the, or particularly around the political economy of wool and attempts to regulate the wool price in the 20th century. But it's only more recently that scholarship has, uh, uh, has emerged focusing on the sociocultural aspects, including the day-to-day -day and creative work entailed in promotion and its broader societal impacts and contributions to an Australian cultural identity. Promotional activity is work that is often behind the scenes and therefore understudied. There's an absence of a strong historical understanding of certain kinds of promotional work, particularly in sectors strongly associated with women, such as fashion and consumer public relations. And this means we do not fully understand the impact of feminized labor or the creation of the female consumer and audience. The Wool Board's promotional activity was integral to shaping cultures of consumption. Much of the promotion helped create a particular image of rural Australia combined with contemporary Australian fashion. And of course, the photographers Talbot and Newton were pivotal here. Dickinson described it as a uniquely Australian aesthetic and Ferrero Rages as a sophisticated, urban, industrialised and consumer Australian society. The wool board promotion depended on the significant use of creative workers, uh, photographers, illustrators, copywriters and designers to develop these campaigns, confirming Dickinson and Crawford's identification of the importance of the advertising sector as a precursor to contemporary cultural and creative industries. The findings reflect other scholarship that shows the significance of fashion to the formation of national identity and increasing cosmopolitanism in Australia in the post-war period and up until the end of the 1960s. The findings recognise women's contributions to the development of media and promotional industries. Making their labour visible enables a reconceptualization of the historical development of promotional work and of related media industries in Australia. The feminisation of certain kinds of media and cultural work with corresponding, corresponding invisibility, marginal status and lower pay point to the need for more research to better understand and address the significance of feminised labour. The fact that Sanders had a strong public profile and her salary was perceived as extravagant and her promotional work as unnecessary and excessive only points to some of the gendered fault lines that played out alongside the politicised promotion of wool and the gendering of the advertising and business sectors. Many of the women working in promotional roles from the 1950s onwards challenged Fordist assumptions around male breadwinners and women in the domestic sphere. Their home duties did not cease with paid employment, yet female practitioners often had powerful effective attachments to their work. Certainly in her memoirs, Jobbins describes her need to earn money. She estimates her alcoholic husband worked for less than one third of their marriage and she needed to support five children. Advertising agencies were accommodating employers and even when Jobbins husband sold the house without telling her and took a job in Sydney, she was able to continue working for for the wool board in their Sydney office for another five years, at times commuting to Melbourne for three days each week. In summary, this paper focuses on the widespread promotional activity and the work of two women at the wool board in the 1960s, and it offers three insights into the impact of their work. The first points to the significance of promotional work for media history in terms of the way it funds, shapes and informs media content and coverage. The second highlights the importance of promotional culture and the links between promotion and consumption. In the case of the Wool Board, the promotional campaigns contributed to a cosmopolitan Australian identity nationally and internationally. The final insight makes women's promotional work visible and establishes promotional work as an important site for understanding gender and the labour force to date a neglected aspect of media history. Wow, thank you, Kate, that was wonderful. Really enjoyed that. Are there any questions from the floor? Go for it, Bridget. Thanks, Josie. It's nice to see you there as well. Kate, that really was fantastic. Um, can I ask if there was any, um, if, if you've picked up on any sense of 
some competition between the media outlets um, for some of the, it's both advertising copy and sort of pr for promotional specials. I'm, I'm wondering, for instance, about the Women's Weekly. I, I know you showed at least one um, page, I think, from 1968 in there. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if um, there, um, if, if you picked up on any sense of the Women's Weekly perhaps being a little bit put out by the emergence of Vogue and the possible placement of other material um, in, in the new magazine? Well, I haven't, I haven't come across that, but it's probably something I should be looking out for. Um, there, was a, there, were some, there were other fashion magazines as well, and not only was it the, sort of the direct advertising from the wool board, but increasingly it was the kind of campaigns they developed and the, the, the kind of shared the cost with industry or they had um, both manufacturers and fashion, fashion houses, often department stores who were manufacturing their own lines, would engage in supporting campaigns. So there was a lot of money associated with this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was very competitive. Um, there was a really curious campaign when the wool board went to New Guinea in 1971. You might be familiar with some of the imagery of that. And they had a fashion shoot in, in New Guinea with the natives, um, just as New Guinea was gaining independence. And I think that was right. in the Australian Women's Weekly. I think they had an exclusive for that. Okay. That's really interesting. I've never heard of that. I'm oh, the... the well they're quite no. um, iconic images. And I've read somewhere and haven't been able to verify it. There was a, another public relations practitioner, Esther Hanfield. And I think her niece was one of the models for that campaign. But I haven't been able to verify that with another source yet, so. Okay, thanks, Kate. I want to ask, Kate, how did you go finding all those archival sources, all those wonderful images from the Women's Weekly and Vogue and that fantastic photo of the women in the middle in lovely, elegant fashion in the middle of this kind of sheep paddock? How did you go about finding That's wonderful, that? isn't it? Yeah. Um, look, I've been collecting some of this for a few years. Um, I was sort of became interested when I was writing my first book, which came out of my PhD, and I have a chapter on women in PR there. And I, so I started collecting um, some of this material there, and it became a bit of a spider's web. Of course, the lockdown has been, especially in Melbourne, and I'm sure every historian at, at this conference feels it very keenly, the inability to travel and the inability to go directly to sources, um, to, to archives. Um, and some archives I've been working in have opened for two weeks this year, basically. Yeah. So, you know, it's really, it's really been tough. Trove has been fantastic. Um, some of the images, certainly Talbot and Newton, are held in various places. So the Esther Hanfield donated the Henry Talbot uh, collection to the State Library of Victoria. Um, but some of these are kind of high artworks that are held in different collections, including in the Monash University art collection and elsewhere. So um, they're, they're out there. They're not always in the same place. And what, I'd re what I really want to do is get to Sydney and go through the Joy Jobbins archive that she donated to the powerhouse and oh. go through that properly. And I haven't been able to do that. But I think a lot of her work was um, featured in a exhibition at the powerhouse in 2007 two years before her first book came out she's she's 100 by the way i'm working on the third book in her trilogy oh wow i was going to ask wow. if she was still alive um, well I, I should have double checked that she was earlier this year i was yes. um corresponding with her daughter wow who told and me she was working on her third book and have you have you interviewed her or do you have plans to interview her I'd like to. I don't know what I'm going to get out of um, somebody who sounds like a, 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 certainly until recently, you know, still somebody who was pretty cluey about what was going on. She wrote the obituary <laughs> for Nan Sanders in the Sydney Morning Herald in 2014. Um, her daughter Sheridan seems to have been quite involved and has written extracts in the second book that she wrote, sort of like of her childhood memories of the things that she's recounting. I have to say the books are, a, um, are, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're a fairly, can you see this? This is her first one, Shoestring. This is Joy modeling a swimwear on the cover. It's a fabulous book. And then she did this more kind of anecdotal one um, with her, which is probably a little bit more, but, but they're very, 
personal and um, acknowledge the kind of abuse from her husband and the rather difficult kind of um, wow. circumstances in which she was bringing up this family mm. um, and, and being the main breadwinner as well. He couldn't hold down a job and really I found some of it quite hard to read. Mm. Also the amount of alcohol that gets consumed. Mm. And, and she makes a note at the back of one of the, uh, you know, as kind of afterward um, about, I know I've talked a lot about alcohol, but that's the way it was. I tried to do a spreadsheet of how much she drunk in the first book because she was even giving recipes and things for cocktails and and the number of limousines with cocktail bars that she would always note when she was drinking out of them I mean it sound it, it sounds kind of um glamorous but also you got the kind of horror of the kind of alcohol at home as well and mm. she got very drunk um, one night before um she, she was due to go into hospital with one of her children and was due in at four o'clock and, and met a girlfriend in Florentino's her favorite restaurant at two and they started drinking and had a meal and then all the boys joined them and she arrived at the hospital very drunk late at night and the matron was furious understandably so kind of alcohol was all pervasive I think in the work culture mm. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah I don't know how I got onto that I, I, I want to know what your book's called um uh, the history one is professionalizing public relations history gender and education that came out in 2006 and I had another book come out late last year but that was more on kind of um contemporary I wrote it with Judy Motion and it's on uh, more contemporary impacts of public relations Wow, essential this reading for cool. public relations, public practitioners and students. Any other questions? So, Andrew, did you have a question earlier? Thanks very much for your talk, Kate. Actually, I was going to, <clears throat> excuse me, I was actually going to ask about your books and I'm, I'm looking you up on, on your uh, Monash site there now anyway. So um, I've got a list of all your publications. But also you mentioned... Um, a book by Dickinson, or a publication by Dickinson from 2016. Mm. Uh, was, was that the, the book? There was a book on... Um, uh, I think it's called... Women. I think it's simply called Women in Advertising. Yeah, I think I think that's the one I'm thinking of, yeah. Yes. I didn't know if that... I thought there might have been a later, another one, that's all. She's, um, Dickinson's... Well, that's the one I was referring to because she's got a whole chapter around the wall board and... Um, Jobbins and Sanders work which at one level I thought oh my word have I still got something to write about but I think I'm, I'm more interested in developing the kind of um, gender and labour aspects uh, kind of in a broader social context um, and certainly moving beyond thinking about um, advertising as such I think I see this much more in promotional culture terms and more broadly about what the links are with media history and how these things are kind of both part of but also written out of media history and that's a tension that I guess I'm still working through. Certainly a lot of women in um, public relations in my experience anyway um, and you know and often at managerial levels and things like that um, you know it is it's it's probably a it is in a way a feminized industry perhaps or a feminine industry it's an interesting industry to explore in terms of gender Yes, I think it's a good site for understanding feminised labour that because mm. of that. And it wasn't always a feminised industry, although women always worked in it, yeah. if, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, what, what's interesting, and I see my colleague Mark Sheehan's in the room, um, what's interesting is most of, I was going to say until I came along, I, that makes me sound really arrogant, and I don't mean to be, but public relations histories were very much in Australia written based on the kind of few founders, the founding fathers, if you want, and the great men of PR. And they were involved in setting up the professional institutes after the Second World War. And so you had this very narrow kind of um, evolutionary narrative towards the modern profession that completely wrote out all these women who were in the 1950s on the state professional um, institute boards and committees and quite involved. And as the industry did feminise, they got kind of excluded. So by 1971, there was only one woman on a state public relations institute board mm -hmm. all around Australia, and that was in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. So you had these massive boards of all men and no women, but it had been quite different in the 50s. Mm, that's interesting. Jennifer. Okay, fabulous talk. Absolutely wonderful. Um, 
I'm aware that some of the early publicists for the ABC were women and were given opportunities to travel, to go on placements uh, with the BBC and so on. And I wonder if there was any linkage between uh, women who were involved with PR from one area to another. Yep, um, Bonnie McCallum was the, uh, says she was the first female publicist um, and she was with the ABC in Melbourne. I think she's from Ballarat. She's written her memoirs and there is the most excruciatingly awful book to read. It's like this name dropping of Melbourne society and, you know, there's no substance there at all, but she was very well connected and um, I think went on to be on charity boards and things after she left. Um, and she was, so I've written a little bit about Bonnie McCallum and I have found some interaction with her and Betty Stewart who worked in kind of theatre and entertainment doing public relations for six decades. And so I was working in the Betty Stewart archives in the performing arts collection in Melbourne, which are the ones that frustratingly have really been closed since early last year. And in the Betty Stewart collections, there are there's some ephemera and a kind of autographed scarf that belonged to Bonnie McCallum. So there obviously were links across there as well. But no, no association or that you're aware of or anything of that sort. Um, all informal underneath. But well, uh, this is what I'm curious about because there were obviously some friendships around. I think Bonnie McCallum was quite high society compared to some of the other women whose work I've been investigating. On the whole, they're um, perhaps Betty Stewart less so, but you know, on the whole, they're kind of middle class women with some education. They've often travelled before they work in, in PR. They've had some global mo mobility, um, and either have either travelled internationally or they've worked internationally. Um, but my impression is the ABC publicist was kind of a little bit more high society or aspirational in who she hung out with. That could be completely wrong. Well, actually, based on her memoirs, <laughs> that, that seems to be how she's positioned. Yeah. Thanks. I'm ever so sorry, but I can't see um, who's got their hands up. So it, does anybody want to jump in with another question? Josie, if, if we've got a moment, could I just mention something particularly directed at Kate, but also um, Marama, the Australian Dictionary of Biography, um, which has obviously for decades been trying to um, increase the number of women in its volumes, um, is actually now setting up a um, uh, working party focused specifically on women. So this will sort of be over the top of the state working parties. I just want to alert you to the fact that the ADB is particularly keen at the moment on identifying women who died between 1996 and 2000 who could possibly fall between the cracks. Now, obviously, the women you've been talking about um, today, Kate, lived past that. But if you do think of anyone, um, if you could perhaps shoot me an email. Um, I've also been talking to Janine Baker about this over the last couple of weeks, and she's um, suggested someone really good for us. Um, but if you'd be willing to send me an email, then we can chat further about it and I can see who best to send it to, whether it's the new working party or whether it's one of the state working parties. But I just want to let you know that this is a real sort of drive and initiative that's out there now. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. What's, what's the rationale for that um, time, very tight time frame of four or five years? It's, it's, it's the ADB structures. It's both a federation, so everything is sort of commissioned by state working parties, but it also goes through years. And um, so the next published volume will be on people who died between those years. Um, so obviously, since the ADB was established in the 1960s, you know, it began colonial and it's gradually moved up to now publishing things on people who died in the 1990s. Um, so there will still be time to pick up on people who die in the early 2000s. Those volumes will appear down the track. OK. And you think that they would be interested in female promotional women who worked yeah. in promotional media type roles? Oh, I think, yeah. Yep. They should definitely be looked at, yeah. Okay, great. 
absolutely I'd love to contribute to writing them into the historical record uh, yeah yeah again I, I can't see seem to see who's got their hand up so uh, if any other if there's any other questions please um just jump in hey Mark yes. here. I was Hi, just Mark. going to ask how are you? Um, Good. I was going to ask uh, Dobbins's influence on her daughter, because she was well known as being the youngest ever TV presenter. Did she um, facilitate her career in any way, do you think? Or was there? Oh, absolutely. She writes about it um, quite a lot. She was broke, she ah. needed the money. And she started a children's cooking TV show from her kitchen at home. And her eldest daughter was actually uh, an accomplished actor. And it probably should have been her, but she was, I think, in her teens. And so they went for the girl who was eight or 10, Sh Sheridan Jobbins, who Jobbins said had no talent. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the daughter that's sort of, you know, really um, facilitating, or, you know, is, is written into the second memoir. and. Um, the one that I've corresponded with. So, um, so yeah, Jobbins was absolutely behind that and did all the production and they had no idea what they were doing, but they they got a contract for, a, a, you know, the TV cooking series and you can still find little extracts on YouTube. It's quite sweet. Yeah, I can remember it as a kid. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jobbins was really sc scrambling for money. She um, set up a, when she left the wool board, um, she had all these connections and she'd, you know, been running this, the biggest promotional account in, in the country. And it opened a lot of doors, but everybody said she was overqualified or they couldn't afford her. She set up a, her own magazine, which was um, designed to promote Australia for investment and immigration. And she had envisioned lots of TV deals and kind of cooperative um promotions with the travel sector and the hospital you know hotel sector and it, di it didn't really come off so she was quite entrepreneurial and not all of it worked but the, I think the the kids cooking show was you know came after that as an attempt yeah. to make money she ended up doing a lot of work um producing television and um radio advertising like writing scripts and producing them oh, cool. okay um one last call for questions and then we'd better nip off for lunch i just want to thank everybody for coming along and for your engagement in the paper and your really lovely comments and feedback I'm re i really appreciate it so thank you and josie for your chairing no problem at all okay everybody uh, i've been told to remind you all that we've got to jump out of this session and then i believe at 11:45 we can go into an optional networking se uh, session. So um, thank you all for being here and thank you, Kate, for a wonderful presentation. And I shall see you all hopefully this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.